Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Aisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz, F. Mine. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On this week's episode, we have the pleasure of reuniting two intensely creative individuals who first worked together decades ago, Emily Haynes and Olivier Asayas. Haynes is, of course, the singer and primary songwriter for the band Metric, which she's been fronting for the past 20 plus years, and which sprang from the same fertile Canadian scene that gave the world Broken Social Scene and Stars, among many others. In fact, it's Haynes' voice that you hear on Broken Social Scene's biggest, and I would argue best, song, Anthems for a 17-Year-Old Girl. But her primary focus over the years has, of course, been Metric, which just released their ninth album of thought-provoking indie rock anthems, Formentera 2. It's a sequel to the excellent album they released exactly a year prior, and another collection of danceable, fantastic songs. Check out a little bit of Just the Once from Formentera 2, which Haynes describes as, quote, regret disco. So what does a catchy Canadian indie band have to do with a fearless French filmmaker like Olivier Assayas? A lot, as it turns out. Back when Assayas was prepping his 2004 film Clean, he needed a band to perform in a scene, and when he saw Metric, everything clicked. You can see the band perform their early hit Dead Disco in the movie, and Haynes and Assayas hit it off after working together. Like Metric, Assayas has created an incredible body of work over the years and done it, again like Metric, by following his own muse. His best-known films include Irma Vep, Clouds of Sils Maria, and 2016's Personal Shopper, for which he was proclaimed Best Director at the Cannes Film Festival. In a strange twist, he was asked to recreate Irma Vep for a TV series for HBO, which he did under the condition that he have total artistic freedom. That came out last year, and it's definitely worth checking out. These two get right into a great discussion about how they approach creating their art. Both rely on instinct rather than any desire for commercial success. They talk about the real Formentera, it's an island in Spain, versus the one that Haynes created for these albums. They touch on Haynes' father, a well-known poet, and how that might have figured into her creative growth. Also, you'll learn from this chat that every piano has one great song in it. Enjoy. So, my friend Olivier, long time. Oh, long time. <laughs> and uh, uh, and, and it, fe- it, it feels like uh, time did not pass. I don't even want to think about how long it was since we've seen each other. I, I don't think time has passed. I just feel like in the same moment. I know exactly what you mean. It's like a phrase mark, I guess, of 20 mm-hmm. years because yeah. we're playing right now all the music from when mm-hmm. we met you, from our first mm-hmm. album. So a dead mm-hmm. disco <laughs> and, and your film. And we're revisiting all those songs mm-hmm. for the 20th anniversary. Mm. And this is exactly how I feel. I'm standing next to Jimmy and Josh and Jules and we're playing dead disco. And it's like, it feels like nothing has changed. It feels like time has not changed also because I've been listening to your music and loving it and just, you know, just being really excited by all the new directions you've been going. It felt like it was the beginning of Metric and I loved what you were doing, but I'm just, you know, once in a while, I mean, I was just amazed by, you know, how far you went and how, you, you know, how you invented new directions and so on and so forth and really invented the band in so many ways exciting ways i've just been a fan for the last for, for, the, for the last few years yeah well likewise i've been stalking all your movies as they come out so um i loved personal shopper obviously mm-hmm. and the clouds yeah. also so so good and i felt yeah. like when i saw that irma vep got picked up as a tv show on hbo yeah. i was like yes it's it <laughs> continue it continues you know i don't know how you feel about those all those um when movies are revisited i always wonder for filmmakers what that feels like with Irma Vep. yeah it was a very weird uh, uh, story because it's a, because it's a movie that i did you know in 96 i don't mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's a long, <laughs> long time ago, very long time ago. But I did it for no money. I, I wrote it in a week, and all of a, all of a sudden, it became uh, an HBO series. That and 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 we had like forty million dollars to do it, and you know, just and and for some reason, we managed to have the same freedom we had when we made the first version. I would not have revisited Irma Vap if I did not have the main ingredient, which was total artistic freedom. And that's what uh, A24 and HBO gave me. So I kind of made this crazy, this crazy series, which, which, you know, I mean, I, I'm always confused between, you know, movies and series. I mean, to me, there's no difference, really. I mean, I put as much of myself in the project when I'm doing Emma Vep or when I'm doing any of my other movies. I very much function the same way. And what I am amazed with is how you have evolved as a unit how you've stayed together, you have come function in a similar way for so long. And at the same time, I feel that you have the same passion, the same energy. You know, I've been listening to the new new album and I just, I was really impressed with, with, with the last album, with Foreman Terra 1 and Doom Scroller is just a, such a daring and exciting and successful idea. To, you know, the one thing I, I, I because I, I didn't make sense of is, were you actually in Fomentera or is, is it uh, some kind of fantasy island in your world? Yeah, it's, I have been there, but the concept was, and I, I, in fact, I was very surprised more people didn't see the reference, but to me, a very famous and important film, Terry Gilliam's Brazil, uh-huh. right? You know that film? Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah of course I do. Sure, I do. Yeah, it's a fantasy place. That is an actual, it's obviously Brazil is a literal place, but in the context of the film, Brazil is just this imaginary mental state that is developed to cope with the insanity of the world and his Mm. fantasy place. So in our case, you know, during the pandemic, that was definitely the closest we were getting to any sort of island was one that we would create in our minds. It's so interesting because because it's um, I used to go there. I mean, I was I was a I w- I remember who wrote that song. I mean, there was that that that, that song for Montero Lady, which would be some kind of prog rock man like King Crimson or something. Oh yeah, I remember looking that up to make sure that no one else had had that album title and. Pink Floyd as well recorded and played sh- like shows in a club there. Yes, yeah, yeah. That, that was in um, in Ibiza, which is next mm-hmm. to next to Terra, which was also mm-hmm. for- no, no. I think I think it's a it's, it's a King Crimson song. <laughs> yeah, from Terra Lady. Yeah, I lived in Ibiza for a while too, so I I've had a familiarity with it, mm-hmm. but it was it was more you know now I think what we created I'm sort of like going there in my mind more than probably the physical island. <laughs> I had a girlfriend whose mother had a house in uh, in Fomentera. So I, I used to go there like every year, loved it. And I always had a passion for the island. And one specific year, I went there on my own. And it's the only experience I, I've had of spending, I don't know, like three weeks, a month, all on my own, absolutely on my own in this beach cabin in Fomentera. And it's... Uh, it's right after I had shot um, Vep. I remember spending a month there, which which has been like the most peaceful month in my life. How that's such a strange correspondence for you and I to have it connect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because when we were finishing Formentera Two. Mm-hmm. That took us back to the neighborhood that we discovered when you brought us to Paris. Mm-hmm. So we had this a similar sort of in reverse connection of that feeling of like being back in Montmartre and, you know, remembering ourselves at that time. You know, it was really the very beginning. We'd only been in New York and L.A. and Toronto mm-hmm. at that point and our first album. And when you... Because of our involvement with your film, we just got to enter Paris in this completely unique way that somehow mm. still seems to last. We have such a connection every time we play there. But particularly this time, after everything that's happened, you know, being back in Montmartre and being at Motorbase, we were remembering all this stuff like um, 
Agnes B. Yeah. Obviously, an incredible mm-hmm. designer, and she's so involved in cinema in so many ways with her production companies and everything. But you know, she, we had no clothes. Totally. Like we had, we had. I had one <laughs> stage, you know, stage outfit that I would wash in the sink, and then I would just wear it again. <laughs> we were at right at, in the deepest grind and beginning, and so committed to our freedom and to our we didn't care how poor we had to be you know very stubborn about the art and all those good things Mm. that I think are why we're still here today but Agnes B offered us some clothing I remember Mm. we went to a to a little party at her shop and we were offered to go to the beautiful showroom and get some clothes and now you know now I understand how it normally works is that's very nice. You go in and you take maybe an eyeglasses case or one shirt or something, you know, but we were like, oh my God, this is great. Mm-hmm. So we all got so many clothes. Like we were the people at the, you know, checking us out, you know, just, they were like, what is this? These people have no idea, but it, it was our wardrobe for, I still have a skirt from Agnes B that I wear all the time, which I, I now I look back with such um, affection you know, mm-hmm. for ha- for how we were, because, you know, as you're saying about Irma Vep, like the mm-hmm. only way it works is if you were able to have that same freedom and autonomy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. I feel like the way that we established that at the beginning, which made things harder at the beginning, is why we have this longevity and we have this meaning to the work, because otherwise it's all eroded. Yeah, I remembered that at the time... One guy in the band told me, well, you know, maybe, you know, in, maybe in 20 years we will be saying when you, when we were shooting clean, it was really the beginning of metric. And maybe it was also the beginning of you, of, of something else for you. And it, and, and it really struck me because in the back of my mind, I said, well, you know, rock and roll, it lasts a few years and yeah and, you know and men's change and also my work will change who knows where i will be in 20 years time but it was it i was impressed by how clear it was i think in your collective mind that you were at the threshold of of, of an adventure that you were there for a long time and and you and you were like conscious that you had something very solid functioning between the four of you and 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 it was going to last once in a while i remembered it and uh, so when we arranged this this uh, this uh, meeting i you know it just came back again to me and said well he was right i mean he was he was right metric was going to be around for a while and we were going to stay friends it was amazing how you brought to the film exactly the energy that I kind of needed at that point for that film. You know, it's, 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 uh, it was very much a chance meeting because, you know, we were in Toronto. We, were, we, we had no idea with what band we were looking for. We were looking for some generic rock and roll band who would, sure. who, who would look cool on stage. You know? and, and then we listened to your first album. It, ju- it just amazed me. I said, I-, I can't believe it. I mean, this is exactly what we're looking for. And then when we met, I realized, you know, you could, you were exactly right for the little part you had to play. You had to play. I- I- I actually, I think you should not have dropped your career as an actress. You should revive it <laughs> once in a while. Well, any, anytime, <laughs> anytime you want to revive my career as an actress, please go ahead. <laughs> We, we get, oh. I mean, I, <laughs> okay, I'm taking this very seriously. I'm taking, <laughs> okay, put it in mind. But we're doing these small concerts for the anniversary, right? So we're doing um, mm-hmm. New York, LA, Toronto, London, Paris, Berlin. And uh, mm-hmm. so we were preparing for this and we watched the uh, La Route de Rock festival that we played around the mm-hmm. time when, you know, we were in Paris, thanks to you. And that was when also we connected, yeah. which I also think is from our relationship. Um, we connected with Sonic Youth at that time, because of mm. course you had, had had them work on Demon Lover and they were um, so important to us, you know, being a band from New York and us living mm. in New York. And I'll always remember Kim Gordon at that festival. Again, you know, it's these times, as we're saying, so early in your career, 
that now you can see so clearly these were just pivotal moments, foundational moments. I love the little movie we made. I mean, you know, we, 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 we filmed the whole thing. So that there is a documentary that kind of uh, memorizes the whole event. Of Root the Rock, the, well, are we, yeah. the concert footage is on YouTube and it's, it was really stunning for me to to watch because I I don't I don't look at anything right like I like to go forward so I don't watch mm-hmm. old stuff but for this to prepare for these shows yeah. the guys were like really you should check it out because it's filmed really well and it sounds really good um, but it was just yeah astonishing to see like we're so we're so ourselves mm-hmm. like we're so committed. Um, and serious and but we're like but it's funny but we're so, we're just like it was really um you know sometimes you look back and you cringe a little bit or something in this case it was just I was so like proud of my little sister as myself you know like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool to have I just thought that you had at that at that, at that point such a it was you were just so focused I mean, it was it, very it was very impressive I mean, you had this spirit of rock and roll, which, which at that time felt eventually with Dover Band felt dated, but with you felt right exactly at the, happening at the right moment when it was needed, just to remind that th- this is the best version of what rock and roll. I thought that you just reinvented something that needs to be reinvented once in a while and ultimately i i don't know i mean you know i as my, i i love the last album i love the i, I love uh, the first album and i think that usually bands lose something in the in, in the process some some of the urgency is is lost and what i find remarkable is that you have never lost uh, that uh, uh, sense of necessity, of urgence, of urgency, of necessity. You're you're, tra- you're constantly transforming it. I think a lot of times with that genre of like you know big quotes, it, rock and roll is you know a leather jacket and a guitar. These are mm. signifiers mm. only of rebellion. If there is some rebellion, <laughs> but mm. the t- the same two you know, sort of symbols can mean be dated and conformist. So we would, for, it ends up being, in our case, the more rebellious thing is to go pop or to mm-hmm. change the yeah. idea of, of what should be, what should be okay. When I would look back at the beginning, I think, okay, why did you have to be so intense? You know, couldn't you just relax? And it, and the answer is no, you can't, like, now I can relax a little, <laughs> but at the beginning, you know, no, no so you can't. Uh, you can't. And like, and, you know, I think of it with your films as well as like how the, I, and I have always wondered that idea of, as we're talking about, you know, the keeping the essence mm. and the urgency, but not be, not repeating yourself, not being redundant. Yeah, re- it's such it's a, absolutely. it's such a s- special place where you're it's almost as though the process through your life is to slowly glean and reveal that essence yeah and i think there's there's something that can be said about any art it can be painting it can be poetry it can be music it can be it it, it can be it can be movies i've all I've, i've always felt close to what you were doing and I've always related to what you were doing because in a certain sense there is a melodic uh, straightforward um, energy which I interpret as some sort of realism which which is similar to the kind of realism I've been looking for in my movies I mean I've always done movies that were contemporary movies that had that had their fair share of abstraction but at the same time I always had faith in the very straightforward energy of just connecting with your audios on a very simple basis and i think that that's what you have been doing in your music because 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 there is something melodic that a lot of 
rock bands kind of forget about because it's not cool if they are more abstract if they feel m- m- cool but I've ultimately th- that doesn't concern you that concerns me you you know you know, it's it's a thin line between uh, self staying true to yourself and at the same time uh, you know just not losing your grasp on the present which is ultimately the main question you have to answer when ultimately we, you build something through time decades this is my feeling is you know, the question of why you make art and that it's, you know, to participate and to find out about yourself as much as you can, but also to be part of what happens in your own life and in the world. And if you're too insistent on maintaining some, you know, conceptual idea of authenticity, you've eliminated Mm -hmm. most of most experience. Like for us, there's no there's no agenda, right? Like we're not, as we like to say, like we have no idea what we're doing. We just <laughs> you just go <laughs> in and and it's no. pretty much like when something feels like bullshit or it's just not true. It's just not connecting or it's not with us, you know, and it's without any pr- thought of commercial viability. It's just more you feel it or you don't internally with us. I'd be curious to know if you've ever scrapped something uh, after a big time commitment, but we did like a 60 piece orchestra on a song and a whole big elaborate thing. And then, you know, th- you know, whatever, hundred thousand dollars, whatever you do. And then we're just like, no, if it doesn't give me that feeling, we won't, we won't release it. Have you ever, have you ever thrown away something after a big commitment? <laughs> yes, 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 I, yes, I, have, but, 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 uh, unwillingly, <laughs> unwillingly. Ah, okay. interesting. It's, it's, uh, they're, they're, I mean, they're in, including a movie that I was supposed to, that, that I was supposed to shoot in Toronto, uh, which fell apart like one day before shooting. But that's, that's, oh, no. really, uh, it was, mm-hmm. it, it, oh, no, it was just like a catastrophe. And it was a movie with Robert Pattinson and Robert De Niro. And we were shooting in Toronto and in Chicago. And it, and, and the film just fell apart because the financier was weird. But ultimately, things that, you know, movies that don't, should not happen, don't happen. And there's always a exactly. reason. Exactly. Exactly. But I'm, but I, you know, I love how, that's the rule for us and yeah. how we how we yes. work is just like we just if we don't if we don't feel it we don't care if what the loss is but then it ends up being quite cohesive actually yeah. Yeah. oh even despite our very strange process <laughs> I think it's the only way to function you know the, way, the only way to function is with your instinct I think it's all about doing what you need to do what you want to do at a specific moment and being in touch with yourself at that time I often say that ultimately when I I start writing screenplays when I have my back to the wall I mean like you know I have no other idea I have I have, I have like one idea which kind of feels right and I start writing it because ultimately I have nothing. I have nothing else. It's yeah, the only yeah. <laughs> Necessity is the mother of invention. I love that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and I think, and I think that's what exactly what you, what you are describing. Gradually you understand why you are doing this and not doing that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and there's no rule and there's no security. You move forward in the most honest and dedicated way but you 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 are not dependent on a big theory or the logic of the industry or whatever i, I think it's the only way it's the only way because you're, because it's the only way you can, you can make something that's genuine that is yourself and ultimately that will propel you mm. into other, other areas but the, but the difficulty is not repeating yourself i mean the, the, the difficulty i mean and for me it's always been like that i just hate the notion of doing again something that I've already done. I, I've never felt like I'm on a path where I'm going to move from A to B to C. I mean, I I know that I will, maybe I will start with Z and then move on <laughs> yeah. to T. 
<laughs> and then, totally. and then at some point, at some point, get to A, but who knows? Maybe, yeah. not, maybe never. Yeah, uh, and the, and the, the idea of identity through that is is revealed in yeah in a, in a very abstract way because you will find out at the end of your life who you were. You know, I mean, that's that's what I'm not to be so you know. <laughs> existential but i but i do oh, feel like this is what we're in as a as a band we're like who are we <laughs> but what's great with being in a band is that also you function within a collective and then that's mm. something i've been ve- always been ve- very jealous of because when you are a writer you you sit in your at your de- in front of your desk and you're on your own and you don't and you and and you have nothing. I mean you know you you uh, w- w- and 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 or when you're directing, the directing is a very lonely job in 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 many ways. And I've been trying to work with the same crew, often the same cameraman, often the same the same um, art director, often the same costume designer. And I feel like we in our way we are a band. You know, in, yeah. a, in a way in a, in a way they bring me the kind of collective energy that comes naturally to rock and roll but which is alien to cinema in many ways Mm -hmm. well i relate to the to the writing part isolation because i'm the writer of the songs you know like jimmy and i will have some process but for the most part it's me at the piano and i know that feeling is just so um isolating but essential Mm -hmm. but i'll feel you know I'll be at my place in the woods and it's like everything falls apart around me. You know, if I'm not writing, I'm this very functional person with my nice home and I'm cooking and taking care of the dog. But when I'm writing, it's like it's like a heroin den. There's without the heroin, obviously. Um, <laughs> but it's like I won't you know, the it'll be dark. The fire's not on. There's no lights <laughs> on. My dog will be like, feed me, you know, like it's such a, <laughs> it's such a place that I go to. And it's that I've been like that since I was a little kid. Like I still remember being, you know, five or whatever. And the yeah. feeling I had when I sat at that piano was like, this is a portal, you know, I felt like I was sort of in a meditative trance yeah. and as though all the songs and all the truth that I might be able to reveal about anything was sort of already embedded in the piano. And mm. I still have that feeling, in fact, with um, that every every piano has one song already in it. So When I travel, I I find houses with a piano and I like to do solo travels and I'll go and every time it's like, okay, like in, I was recently in Rome, I found this great place. It's like, okay, be prepared for the, because the first time you touch this piano, there will, you will get one song. Um, So I've been on a, on a, these travels this year doing that in various uh, places. But you are describing so well your process in terms of writing and creation. And, but that, that does it, uh, has it, because you are the daughter of a poet, part of you that is, has, and has always been, I mean, that, that, does it mean something to you? Yeah. He was such an unusual writer as well. And in fact, mm. my further connection to Paris is because of him. He went there in the 50s Mm -hmm. and met Michel Contat. Oh, yes. I remember him. Do you? Uh, And he's, so he's my godfather. So when I'm in, particularly when I'm in Paris, I feel that connection to Paul and my dad and, and Michel and picturing them discovering this, the more experimental jazz of that time where people you know, the, oh, yeah. the, when, when we hear it now, sometimes it seems like too much or something, but grasping that people were inventing this way of communicating is how I see it. So for my father, though, all the, you know, he never was a musician at all, but these very, um, you know, Carla Blay, obviously, uh, but very, very accomplished and unusual artists were drawn to his writing because they felt like he wrote the way that they were trying to play with this yeah. sort of freedom and yet his uh way of writing was very lean um everything stripped away and Mm -hmm. you know again with that sense of necessity like he he would always say you know these are poems but this isn't poetry (laughs) (laughs) that's a beautiful way to say it it's a beautiful 
Yes, I was a teenager, but I re- I remember the kind of energy there was in Paris at that at, at that time that had to do with free jazz, and you know you 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 had the art ensemble of Chicago, you had mm, and mm-hmm. you had Sun Ra. I mean, I I I saw those guys live in Paris. Wow. You know, like, when I was a teenager, Paris was the city for free jazz. It was a golden period in Paris in those years for free jazz. Yeah, Michel Quintin also, he was a scholar of Jean-Paul Sartre. Mm. So it's like, you know, it makes sense the to me because it's a pretty intellectual form. You know, it feels to me, and maybe this is just because in a way that's what I felt like my dad was embodying was that where the language is seeking the same kind of freedom, yeah. like freedom of thought of and the idea of, you know, shedding your own artifice and your mm-hmm. own affectations, yeah. which in a way, you know, to our theme of, of adaptation, it's in a way the I feel like the more that I am able to, you know, look like this or look like that, or use this instrument or use that instrument, it reinforces how those things are ultimately the superficial expression of something, but you're trying to always just free yourself of your own artifice because it's so, it's so boring to, I don't know, like just, just behaviors, you know, I feel like we adopt ways of speaking as we adapt to the time that we live in or yeah, ways of dressing ways of, you know, and I notice it with myself where it's like, you know, the idea of personality to me is just, it's just such a drag. It's like, (laughs) <laughs> who you know is ultimately you want to be more than that you want to be something like whatever the deeper uh sources of that and not fixate on the the personality and i feel like for me there's a parallel with you know that's why i think my dad said these are poems but it's not poetry you're not posing it's what comes naturally to you it's so it's 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 not a poem it's a way of describing your perception of reality Poem is a is, is a big word, whereas <laughs> what you what you what you are doing is more vital and more simple than that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When you are confronted to the kind of freedom that artists had in those years at that at that, at that time, it's some you know it's something that uh, that is so vital and it's something that uh, we are losing. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's so much art is so commercialized now. I'm always shocked by how people just don't of, often just don't care about integrity, about uh, about uh, experimentation, about uh, about exactly what we are discussing, meaning just keeping a connection to your inner truth and not with what the market around you wants or expects from you. And it's a constant struggle to, to, to keep a hold on that. My feeling is now, I don't even think that's like a thought. I think that it's so, it's the, the walls have been completely washed away. And I think mm. in music, I think people just enter it without even imagining that there would would be something to keep to of yeah. your own the idea of selling out or not only yeah. can you not find someone who's also concerned about selling out they don't even know what you're talking about yes exactly you no know, all i'm trying to do is get paid and that's i'm sorry i have no idea what you mean <laughs> and so it's it is uh i feel quite lucky actually to have lived in the in the time that i have and am like you know, to live through these changes and be able to witness them. Yeah, and yeah. I don't have a chip on my shoulder about any of this stuff. It's all, it, I'm, it's fine. But uh, it's pretty fascinating to to see like how that's changed and, you know, our stubbornness about record labels. It wasn't just this like stance, you know, it's, it's more, first of all, into like, basic intelligence of looking at this contract and how it's just a bad model um mm. and the major label deals we were offered it's just it, it's just a bad model but no. furthermore the point of what we're doing it's like you've you're basically selling the the reason for our existence away exactly so the fact that we didn't ever do it and it made i think it it definitely affected how well known we are you know i've i've we have such a an incredibly loyal and you know amazingly growing uh, fans around the world. You know, we see lots of young people; they find us, right? 
But uh, I think we we definitely were hurt by the fact that we never got that major marketing engine behind us. That's also salvation. Exactly, because now mm. we're in this position where we own everything. And this is the difference but that, you know, with the way that the music industry has changed now and the fact that every, you know, record label is just going to make you self-promote anyway, yeah. you know, so... That's because that's all that all anybody can do is, is promote in the same way. So it's yeah, it's but it's cool to look back on. <laughs> so just clarify by the new album is Formentera 2 instead of being uh, whatever else. It's it's because we wrote this whole song cycle of 18. Uh -huh. It's felt like too much to release as one double album. And yeah, yeah. we didn't want to say in advance that it was two parts. So mm -hmm. And it's definitely this cohesive line through the whole thing. Um, so, you know, this is oh, yeah. a, sort of our our uh, monument at this point in our career, our eighth and ninth album. So I'm really looking forward to this album being out. I need to move on. <laughs> it's, I'm very proud of the work, but it's, um, you know, doom scroller. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> 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 yes, but I think like like all your albums, it's you know it's a step forward. I'm more interested by the way artists function than by I mean with the, it can be within in, in like in in cinema. I'm I'm more interested in the body of work of a specific director rather than than this movie or that movie. I, I think that ultimately what you end up doing is building a body of work. Sometimes you have to disconnect from your from, from your rules, but there is an inner logic to what you, you are doing, which is what really interests me and excites me because that's where, because I've always been interested in this idea of having a dialogue between arts. I think, you know, I've, I've been working with the playwrights, novelists, musicians, and uh, I've always been interested in what there is in common and ultimately what there is in common is the idea of building something, you know, of, of some that reflects your experience of being uh, a human being. For instance, visual artists would go in direction where filmmakers are scared to go or are intimate, intimidated to go and all of a sudden visual artists show how it's doable, how you can go there, how you can try that. And it's the same thing with music. When I started making uh, movies, I had been so influenced by punk rock. I saw the first, uh, the, the first concert by The Clash. I mean, yeah, I saw The Clash. I mean, we were like the album was not, not, not even out and they played this concert in Paris. It just blew my mind. You know, or, or I just remember like the, the moment and the place where I was when I heard God Save the Queen by Sex Pistols for the first time. And it left me with a question which I have not never really answered, which is how can I in movies find the same energy that rock and roll gives me? I mean, you know, and, and, and ultimately what I love about metric is that it, it gave me that thrill. It has such a powerful energy, which is something that, which is exactly the vibe that I'm looking for in my own movies. You know, I, I want to make movies that potentially can give to the audience in a different way. The, 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 the kind of excitement music has given me through the years. And functioning as like a catalyst for something, because oh, yes. it's true how you might hear a punk rock band now and feel nothing like the ones, you know, the clash, oh, yes. right? That was, mm -hmm. that was the expression of that time. I know exactly what you mean, because it's not as though your film can have all these obvious references to rebellion. It's not about, you know, laying it, yeah. laying it yeah, clear, no, but it's that no. feeling of danger which can come in so many ways. Like um, it's on a personal note, I'm in this great relationship, I'm in love. And he's a very, uh, you know, a civilian, as they say, right? So mm -hmm. he's not in the arts and he's, um, <laughs> you know, and he's like, oh, you know, I'm the safe guy or something. And I'm, I have, I'm like, you have no idea. I even talking about it, my heart pounds because it's like, you know, you have no idea how dangerous 
you are for me, <laughs> you know, for me, <laughs> that right? Like a, a very um, stripped down and that like intimacy and vulnerability um, without all of the trappings of show business, yes. uh, ways that we can make, we can perform our lives, you know, taking mm. that away, it, that is dangerous. So I know exactly what you mean of trying to find that in the music that I listen to and in the films that I watch and being such a fan of your work I, now makes so much sense as we talk about this because it's in code in a way, right? Like I can listen to like an ambient track that's just, you know, it's like non-musical, very abstract sound that will give me that feeling of danger. Oh, yes, totally. You're putting it much better than me. I mean, in, in a sense that uh, when I was mentioning The Clash, I mean, it's it's not just about the energy of punk rock. I mean, ultimately, I don't, I mean, you know, punk rock was important to me at that, that specific moment. I mean, now it's become something else completely. It's just the fact of being confused confronted with something that is completely new, something that is out there in the air and no one has really grabbed it. And I think what's great about music is that it does that faster than movies. You know, movies movies take more time to, to absorb what's going on around them. Whereas music has a much, it has a much more intense relationship to the present. And, uh, and in that sense, to me, uh, it's modern poetry in many ways. I mean, to, mm. to, there's no difference between poetry and music and rock and roll in, in you know in, in many ways because because I think the same way poems capture the capture modern reality, I think songs are poetry and they do indeed through the beat, through the, the arrangements, the word, the, the, ener the energy, they capture, uh, the, the capacity to, get, to capture something about contemporary society, which, and, and which is vital. I agree, but I don't feel like people write about that. I feel like that's what I write about, but I feel alone. People just write to me a lot of stupid love songs, and <laughs> I don't care about that. I feel like they're, but then they're all, I'm always finding um, other writers, and I'm such a fan of always looking to be a fan. You know, you want to stay in that state of mind of finding people's work. Because you want to be impressed. You want to be excited. Yeah. You want to, to have a dialogue with people who will bring you something which mm -hmm. has not done before a million, a million times before. I mean, you know, and, 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 and in your art, that's what you are doing. You were mentioning like Clouds of Sol Clouds of Sols Maria. Mm -hmm. To me, it's, it's a typical example of I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, started writing it and I wrote half of it and I left it lay there for like six months because I had no idea what the next act would be. And all of a sudden, I just came up with a logic for what was coming and now the film seems feels extremely coherent and doesn't show really uh, the, the 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 markings of its process. It seems a very elaborate piece of filmmaking. Whereas I know it's amazing. It's it's, it's you know it's, it's 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 like cats. I mean, you 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 fall and you end up falling on your feet, and, yeah. and you don't know you don't you're not sure how you do it and why you got away with it. <laughs> yeah, and you try not to think about it too much and hope it keeps happening. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Well, I think we've been told that our conversation is coming to an end, but I I can't tell you how much it means to me to see you. No time. <laughs> it's uh, time has, no, I'm not, I mean, time has not passed. You are exactly the same person I knew. <laughs> and, and I hope I'm a little bit of the person. You are, you, you are. <laughs> it's like we picked up where we left off. This is so great that we'll see Jimmy will be so happy that we'll see you. And um, yeah. thank you so much, Olivier. Thanks to you, Emily. So it's always a, a pleasure. And it was good. Yeah, I was just so happy with the conversation. Same. Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast. And thanks to Emily Haynes and Olivier Asayas for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please follow Talk House on your favorite podcasting platform and check out all the great stuff at talkhouse.com. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan, and the Talkhouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.